All right, everybody, it is just about one o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and start. I know we have people uh, coming in still, and we'll have people that are able to watch this after the webinar as well. So we'll let you all know on um, social media, et cetera, when this is posted and where you can see it. But first, I just want to introduce um, myself and um, our webinar guest. Very happy to have Stacy Matraza with us today. My name is Jennifer Tyson, and I am the education coordinator for Sunken Gardens in St. Petersburg. So if you haven't been to Sunken Gardens in the past, you need to come. It's a historic tropical garden right in the middle of downtown St. Petersburg, but you'd never know it. Once you walk inside the gates and go down into the Sunken Gardens, you really experience a totally different world um, filled with tropical plants in a subtropical environment. So um, we've been very lucky to stay open during uh, COVID restrictions, but we're trying to have a mix of um, in-person and online events, educational events in particular. So this is one of our first webinars. We're very happy to have Stacy Matrazo, the program coordinator, essentially um, the program manager for the Florida Wildflower Foundation, here with us today to talk all about the new book that they have put out, uh, the book that Stacy has co-authored called Native Plants for Florida Gardens. And that is normally sold in our gift shop, but we've sold out. So that's good, happy news. Um, we are getting more in. Our store um, buyer just purchased 20 more copies. So we'll have even more very soon. But in the meantime, you can purchase it online. So if you go to the Florida Wildflower Foundation's website, you can see it there. It's also on Amazon, I believe. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can purchase this book, but today you're going to get the inside scoop on this new book by Stacey Matrazo and Nancy Bissett. Um, Stacey is with us today, and um, I don't wanna take up too much time, but I would like, Stacey, if you don't mind just um, advancing to the next slide real quick. So if you haven't been to Sunken Gardens, just real quickly, um, I wanna touch on one of the things that I just mentioned, which is that Sunken Gardens is historic. We are over a hundred years old and have a lot of historic plants that are still there. Um, some of the oldest and tallest royal palms in all of uh, Pinellas County, um, including many others. Um, and next slide, Stacy. We don't just have plants, so we have animals. That's part of our history too. So we have some uh, rescued birds, including macaws, um, parrots, kookaburras, et cetera. And we also have a flock of Chilean flamingos. So if you want to experience a tropical winter, Florida style sunken gardens is the place. And uh, we also have a wildflower garden and other native plants that we have included all throughout the garden. So. Um, if you take a look at our butterfly garden, you'll see the wildflowers um, pictured here. You have Gallardia blanket flower that's um, in the foreground. And in the, in the background, you have black-eyed Susan. So these are some very common wildflowers that are very easy to grow. That's one of the reasons that they're in our butterfly slash pollinator garden. And Stacy today is going to explain a lot more about um, some others that are easy to incorporate, but bring so much wildlife value into your garden. It's the reason that we include them in our botanical garden. So without further ado, Stacy, take it away. And please know that when you, um, I said, take it away. I didn't mean it. Um, when you, as a, a viewer, have a question, feel free to add that into the Q&A and I'll be answering as many questions as I can. Um, but towards the end of the program, I'll present others that I can't answer directly to Stacy, and she will be able to respond back. So Stacy Matrazo from the Florida Wildflower Foundation, thank you again so much. Now take it away. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you everyone who is in attendance. I wish I could see you all, but um, I can't, but thanks for being here. Um, my name is Stacy Matrazo. I am the program manager with the Florida Wildflower Foundation, as Jen said. Um, if you're not familiar with our organization, the foundation protects, connects, and expands native wildflower habitats through education, research, and planting and conservation programs. We do this primarily through funds raised 
through the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. And you see here our old design, which we had for almost 20 years. Now we have this lovely new design um, that we've had almost two years now. Uh, whether you have the old plate or the new plate, uh, those funds that we get from the plate uh, sale and renewal are very important to us. They allow us to do programs such as the one you're about to see, as well as provide grants and, for native demonstration and school gardens throughout the state. Um, it allows us to conduct research projects on different topics related to um, commercial and residential, residential horticultural interest. And it helps us um, or funds the production of many of our handouts and brochures on plant selection, um, growing, maintaining plants, um, attracting wildlife, so many more. Um, check out our website, which I will <laughs> give you the URL again at the end of the presentation, um, but um, just to learn more about what we do. And of course, we'd like to encourage anyone who finds our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing that state wildflower license plate. I'm here today to talk to you about our new book, uh, which I co-wrote with Nancy Bissett. Nancy uh, is a member of our board of directors, and she's also the co-owner of The Natives, which is a native plant nursery and a landscape design firm in Central Florida in Davenport. Um, we wrote this book with the hope that it will encourage people to add more native plants to their landscape, which in turn will attract pollinators uh, like native bees and butterflies, provide food and habitat for wildlife, and add more connections and pathways through our urban areas to our uh, natural areas. Florida is one of uh, the most biodiverse states in the country. We've got to over 2,800 native species, uh, more ancient species and more families than any other state. Um, but we're also one of the fastest growing states in the country. So as we, to accommodate this development, we are um, you know, developing our natural lands essentially. And as we continue to do this, we're losing that diversity. We're, we're making our natural areas smaller and more fragmented. And this is problematic for wildlife. Um, and I use this quote from Doug Tallamy, which I think is a really important um, Quote, if you're not familiar with Doug, uh, you should be if you're interested at all in native plants and, and landscaping. Um, he's the author of several books on the importance of using native plants in the landscape. Um, we did a webinar with him back in May and you can view that on the foundation's website or YouTube channel as well. Um, but he's definitely worth checking out. He's done a lot of research to support the things that I'll be talking to you about today. But wildlife depend on these vast expanses of natural land, uh, but they also need safe passage between the fragments. So as we continue to develop our natural lands, um, we need to look to our urban landscapes, to our um, home, to our yards, things like that, to help bridge that divide between these fragmented natural areas and provide resources, provide you know, um, opportunities for safe passage for pollinators, for birds, for other wildlife. And it doesn't matter if you have you know, many, many acres or if you just have a small urban landscape like I do, even the smallest native garden can provide essential resources. We just need to get more native plants in our landscapes. So what we advocate for is a, is a transition from you know, these commonly used non-native ornamentals that have little ecological value to, um, to our native wildlife transition from those to native ornamentals. And yeah, our native plants can actually um, be ornamental. They have um, you know, interesting fruits and colorful foliage, interesting forms, a lot of them flower and fruit throughout the year. So they really do have something aesthetic to bring to your landscape that also provides essential resources for um, wildlife. And we also need to reduce the amount of lawn in our yards. You know, when you think about your lawn, your, uh, your St. Augustine grass, what is it really doing for us? We have to mow it, we herbicide it, we put pesticides on it. It's a lot of work to maintain and it doesn't give anything back. It has no ecological value. So let's get rid of it or at least reduce it. And when we do this, when we add native plants back into our landscape, 
and reduce the amount of lawn, we're inviting wildlife to come enjoy those resources that we're providing. And then our neighbors see it and they see all this life happening in, your, in our gardens and they get excited too. And so that encourages others to do the same. And that's how we start building these pathways. I have a native landscape and then my neighbor does it and then their neighbor does it and so on and so forth. And so we've got these little connected pockets of habitat that, um, you know, again, provide all those resources that wildlife need. So as I mentioned, Florida is home to 2,800 native species. These plants have evolved with our state's unique conditions, um, unique soils, climate conditions. Um, some of the harsh things that we experience here, like drought and hurricane and salt, um, seasonal climate fluctuations, our native plants are used to all that. They've been here as long as the state has been here. And so for this reason, they're better suited to um, survive than a lot of the non-native species that we commonly use in our landscapes. Native plants too, if you use the right plant for the, right con for the conditions in your landscape, that plant will require less water, less or no fertilizer, herbicide or pesticide. Um, because again, these plants are suited for um, the conditions and the pests that already exist here. They know how to protect themselves and how to survive in these conditions. Our native plants also give back soil, uh, give back nutrients to the soil. They help control erosion. And of course, they're part of a healthy, diverse environment. And diversity is really what we are looking for. A good habitat has a variety of plant types. Um, and so we've included a variety in our book. Um, wildflowers create a really pleasing aesthetic. They provide nectar and pollen. Um, they even provide nesting opportunities for some insects. They um, provide seeds for birds. And of course, many birds also favor the, the insects that wildflowers attract. Vines are really good um, to add vertical interest to your landscape. And they're also really useful when space is limited. So if you can't plant out, you can plant up. Um, but again, they provide food and cover for wildlife as well. Grasses are really great for adding texture and movement to a landscape. And they literally help support wildflowers. So it's good to plant grasses among your wildflowers to help keep those taller wildflowers upright, literally. Um, and again, they provide seeds to birds and other wildlife. Um, grasses are nice dense foliage, so they provide cover opportunities as well. And of course, essential to a healthy landscape are trees and shrubs. Um, they can act as a centerpiece uh, or be planted in groups to create a privacy screen. Um, you know, they can serve a function in your landscape in addition to providing those resources. But trees and shrubs also host a variety of microhabitats. So they're, they're hosting insects and other um, smaller wildlife, lizards and frogs and things like that that are feeding our larger wildlife too. So in compiling the plants that we included in this book, we looked um, not only for plants that were tried and true and easy to grow and maintain, but also ones that were readily available at nurseries that specialize in native plants. So there are a lot of cool plants out there, cool native plants. Um, but if you can't get them anywhere, then, you know, it doesn't really help you if you're trying to add something to your landscape. To find a native nursery in your area, check out uh, the Florida Association of Na Native Nurseries website, plantrealflorida.org. You can go there um, and look for nurseries geographically throughout the state. You can also search for plants and find out which nurseries in the state are carrying them. Um, there's lots of other information that this website provides too. And if you're ambitious enough to start from seed, you can visit the Florida Wildflower Seed Growers Cooperative, uh, which is floridawildflowers.com, and you can buy native, um, native plant species seeds. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. So the key to a healthy, thriving landscape is really plant selection. You got to choose plants that are naturally suited to your landscape's light, soil, and moisture conditions. And this will help ensure success and reduce maintenance requirements. So before you select a plant, you wanna evaluate your, your landscape. Is it sunny um, or is it mostly shade? Or is your soil dry, wet, moist? What are the conditions? And then look for plants that um, meet those or need those same requirements. You also wanna take into consideration the plant's growth size. 
most plants that you purchase are not purchased at full size. So you need to consider the plant's potential height and width and give it the space that it's gonna to need to mature. Um, you also wanna consider things like bloom color. So you have a diversity of color in your landscape, um, bloom season as well. Um, again, you know, you want things in your landscape that are providing those resources year round. So evergreen plants that have foliage all the time, um, make sure you have plants that are fruiting at different times of the year, providing nectar and, and things like that. Um, and so what we've done in the book is given you this little quick reference key that you're seeing on the screen here, which have all these different icons that make it really easy at a quick glance to see what the plant's basic needs and performance are gonna be. And so each page or each profile of the book um, includes well, you see uh, a full page or a full photo of the plant. So um, a lot of times we do close-ups of the flowers because they're just absolutely stunning. Um, we've also included a narrative that gives you um, information on what habitat the plant is naturally found in, um, what wildlife that plant attracts, identification details. So you can, you know, what, what do I expect? What is this flower going to, is it going to have petals or is it going to, um, you know, what is it going to look like? What are the leaf structure and things like that. Um, and then in some cases too, we include information on whether or not the plant is edible to humans um, and also information on scientific or common name origin because that's something I'm really interested in. Is why is this plant named whatever it's named? Um, a lot of times there's some really um, fun information or useful information in identifying the plant kind of hidden in those names. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> at the bottom of the page, we have more details on um, you know, things that are gonna help you as a gardener, as someone who's putting landscape or putting plants in your landscape. So we give information on the plant's native range, its bloom season, its growth habit, um, how it can be propagated. Can I do it from seed? Can I take cuttings? Things like that, that you'll wanna know if you wanna continue to grow these plants or to grow more of them. Um, we also include care tips. So, you know, does the plant require pruning? Is it drought or salt tolerant? Can I plant it in mass? Things like that, that you wanna know um, what to expect, what do I need to do once I get these plants and how can I, um, how should I plant them? Um, hardiness zone information. So this tells you where the plant is gonna do best. Um, here, I'm in zone 9B, I think in St. Petersburg, you're in either 9B or 10A. Um, so you're going to want to look for plants that fall, you know, that, that, that are suited for that range to make sure that they are going to do well in your uh, particular habitat. And then we also include information on related species um, and also sometimes if there are non-native or invasive varieties of the plant to be aware of. So we include all of that in that bottom section of the, of the guide. So it's really got a lot of information, but if you're just trying to kind of basically identify some plants, you can just use that quick key in the top. Um, you see here the hammock snake root, white blooms, it blooms summer, fall, and winter. It's full sun to partial shade, moist soils, and it's one to two feet tall. Boom. I know that plant's not going to work in my landscape because that's not the conditions I have, or maybe it will. So I'm going to take you through some of the species that I really like in this book. Um, like I said, we did, it's, it's got a hundred species in it, so I can't cover all of them today, um, but I'll take you through some of the ones that are really easy to grow um, and just tell you a little bit more about them. Um, this is Florida Green Eyes. Uh, this blooms spring and summer, but it can bloom year round as we get further into Southern Florida. And again, you guys are in kind of a dip in the hardiness zone, so you have a lot of the benefits of the Southern, uh, the plants that do well in South Florida. Um, this is a really easy to establish plant. Um, it has a nice thick tuberous root. So once it is um, established, it's drought tolerant. It attracts um, bees and butterflies, and it has a really cool feature. Um, this plant is sometimes called the chocolate plant because when the mature flower is nice and open and you see um, the little maroon starting to happen there, that's when it takes on this very subtle uh, chocolate scent. It almost smells like your neighbors are um, like baking brownies in the air. It's, it's really uh, just amazing and fun. And it's a beautiful, you know, easy, again, easy to grow plant. 
Partridge P, um, this is a good one for just adding some kind of interest in your landscape because it has such a unique flower, this yellow, um, very typical pea, um, pea-shaped flower or what other pea plants flowers looks like. Um, it has these fern-like leaves. The stems are a nice reddish color, so it's really just a neat plant to, to look at, but it's also a great attractor for pollinators. Um, butterflies love it but it's only pollinated specifically by long-tongued bees. So you do get those, even though you've got butterflies and other species coming to it for nectar. It's a larval host for a few butterflies. And um, the leaf stems have nectar glands that attract ants and flies and wasps and other small insects that again, attract birds who are looking for those, um, those insects to eat. The birds also like the seeds. This is an annual to a short-lived perennial, but it's a prolific self-seeder. So um, even you know, once you lose that initial plant, it's gonna be replenishing itself for a long time. And because it's a pea family plant, it's a nitrogen fixer. So it's gonna add nutrients back into the soil and maybe allow you to introduce some other plants that otherwise might not have done well in that particular area. Um, twin flower, again, another, all of these are going to be great plants for attracting wildlife, so I'm going to sound like a broken record just a little bit, but um, this is another good one for attracting bees and butterflies, um, including malachites and white peacocks, and it's a host plant for the common buckeye. Um, it blooms spring through fall, but it can bloom year-round in southern climates. Um, it's exceptionally adaptable. It has a really, you know, nice long bloom period. It spreads readily by underground runners and self-sown seed. So um, it's low growing and it just makes a really nice, easy to care for ground cover. You can actually mow over it um, and it will come back and that will also um, you know, encourage more flowers to come up. Um, if you have a wet environment, this is a really nice plant to include. Um, I should say a wet, large environment. Um, narrow leaf sunflower is a tall plant. It can get four to six feet. Um, it does form dense colonies in nature, so it's not the best plant for a small wildflower garden, but if you live on a retention pond or, you know, some sort of water feature, a larger water feature, if you have a larger area in, in your yard where you can allow this plant to, to really grow um, and take over like it would naturally, um, it just puts on an amazing show in late summer and fall. Um, here in Central Florida, we have a couple areas where you can go see it just in like mass when it's in bloom. It's absolutely stunning, but it does like wet areas, large, open, sunny, um, you know, constantly moist to wet areas. Uh, this is another wet loving plant, um, scarlet hibiscus, another tall one too. Again, it gets, you know, three to seven feet tall. It has one of our most uh, stunning wildflowers here in Florida. It's really large, um, bigger than your hand. <laughs> Uh, about six inches across or more. It blooms in the summer um, and the blooms only open for a day, but the plant itself is a really profuse bloomer. So even though those flowers are, are um, closing up at the end of the day, there's a lot more coming behind it. Um, it's a really good attractor for hummingbirds, butterflies, other pollinators. Um, it's really easy to germinate from seed too. And um, like I said, it's just one of our showiest. It's such a spectacular wildflower. We have uh, four native species of Liatris, Blazing Star, that are typically available um, on the market. There are many more species native to Florida, but um, there are four of them that you can find generally at your native plant nurseries. And they vary from, from the driest to the wettest loving species. They are all excellent nectar plants. Um, they attract butterflies, moths, bees, even the occasional hummingbird. And birds really like their seeds. These are um, good late summer and fall bloomers, excuse me. And um, they do get pretty tall up to around four feet, but these require very little horizontal space. So unlike that um, sunflower I showed you a minute ago that really likes to spread wide, these don't do that. They, they shoot up and they don't um, take over a lot. So they're, they're good in small gardens, um, even in containers or pots um, as well, but they have a nice, um, you know, long wand-like flower. So it's really kind of provides a nice vertical interest. Um, it mixes well with other wildflowers and grasses. 
Um, and it um, is a prolific self-seeder. So you can harvest the seeds and spread them in other areas or just let it reseed itself and you'll get lots more um, blooms, lots more flowers. Dot enforcement, um, if I had to choose like the best plant for attracting the craziest diversity of pollinators, it would definitely be dot enforcement. I've never seen such a variety of pollinators on a wildflower uh, like I have on the dotted horse mint. Um, bees and butterflies love it, wasps do too. Uh, don't let that scare you, wasps are amazing pollinators. Um, and especially when they're on that plant, they're not thinking about anything else. Um, it has a really long bloom time, usually late spring through fall. The plant itself is high in thymol or thymol, depending on your pronunciation. But if you think about the herb thyme, that's exactly what it smells like. It is a member of the mint family, but it has more of a savory, um, oregano-y or thyme-like scent, as opposed to many of our other mints that have that more traditional peppermint, spearmint smell to them. Um, you can brew a nice tea from the leaves of dotted horse mint. It has like a mild relaxation property. So if you think like a chamomile tea, um, you, you can get the same effect from that. Um, and again, it has a really long bloom time. Um, this is one you have to keep an eye on because it does like to spread on its own. Um, if you give it an inch, it will take a mile, um, but you can cut it back and, um, or you know, keep it in check, cut it before it goes to seed and that will help kind of keep minimize its spread. Frog fruit is uh, known by a lot of names. People call this turkey tangle frog fruit, uh, cape weed match head, as you can see, it kind of looks like little match heads. Um, carpet weed and creeping Charlie are also names that um, describe its growth habit. Um, it's a very low growing plant that is another good ground cover, especially if you have, um, you know, full sunny areas. Um, this is another one that you can mow over and it'll come back and flower um, just as nicely. It can form really dense mats. So Again, it's, you know, it's good at holding in soils. Um, it's good in areas where a lot of other things maybe aren't doing too well. And um, it also works in a hanging basket. And I should have mentioned that with twin flower too. Twin flower is a really nice one to put in uh, a hanging basket as well. Um, this one is, uh, again, good for attracting small pollinators because it does have such a small flower head, but it's also a larval host plant for the white peacock, the phaon crescent, and the common buckeye butterflies. So, you know, like I said, it's good to have fruit and flowers, but larval, larval plants are really important too because then you're feeding the caterpillars and you're providing resources to um, regenerate those species. Um, and this will bloom year round. Um, Wild Petty Royal is another mint family plant. And this one has a delightful aroma to it, especially if you crush the leaves. Um, this one is another one you can make a tea out of. This one um, sometimes has a little bit of a lemon mint flavor or scent to it. Um, but again, you can take those leaves, dry them, brew them into a tea, and it's um, quite tasty. This is a low growing shrubby wildflower. So it does get, uh, can get woody, but it's still pretty small. Um, and it has a late flowering period. So late winter into spring. This is something that's gonna be blooming um, in a period when another when other plants aren't providing those resources. So it's good to have, again, you know, things that bloom throughout the year so that you've got a supply of nectar and pollen um, at all times. And this is one of those that will provide those resources when little else is available. Um, wild penny, excuse me, wild petunia. Um, this is, uh, again, a lower growing plant, so it can work well as a ground cover. Another one that you can mow over as well and it'll come back. Um, it attracts bees like bumblebees, leaf cutter bees, um, butterflies like the white peacock, the malachi, even the mangrove buckeye. Um, and it's another larval host for the common buckeye. This um, blooms typically spring through fall, but again, as we move a little further south into warmer climes, it can bloom year round. Um, this is another one whose flowers only last a day, but it has lots of blooms coming up. So it's a successional bloomer, even though the blooms are done by the end of the day. So the plant looks fresh all the time. If you plant it in shadier locations, it does get a little bit lankier and your blooms are gonna be a little bit less. So it does, um, look better in uh, sunnier conditions, but it still does quite well in shady conditions too. 
I mean, this is another one that is um, a pretty good self-seeder. It has a projectile mechanism. So it actually shoots the seeds further away from the host plant or the parent plant. So you will get um, seedlings popping up in areas that you're kind of like, where did that come from? There's no petunia plant near here, but that's why. Um, this one too works um, in a hanging basket as well, or in a container if you don't have uh, you know, a yard to, to plant in. Oh gosh, salvia. We have several salvia plants uh, native to Florida and many of them are available at nurseries. These are probably our most common ones. Um, liar leaf sage that you see on the left has that purple bloom. Um, I think the little guide I have in the corner here, the little quick key is uh, more suited for the tropical sage um, because liar leaf sage tends to bloom in late winter and spring. So again, one of those earlier bloomers to provide resources. Um, the tropical sage on the right, these beautiful red flowers that attract hummingbirds and lots of butterflies and bees, um, it blooms pretty much it's supposed to be summer through fall, but I have them in my landscape and they have not stopped blooming. So I, even here in Orlando, they bloom year round. Um, they're supposed to max out at around three feet tall. I think I have something in my soil in the backyard because I have several that are, are almost six feet tall. And I can't explain it, but I'm, I'm loving it. Um, this is another prolific self seeder. Uh, I have so much tropical sage coming up in my landscape because it just produces so many seeds and they germinate super fast. So um, it's, you know, it's a great, if you wanna fill in an area, you can put a few of these in and it will um, really easy, easily and quickly start to fill in. Goldenrod, um, again, we have several species of goldenrod available at nurseries. This one is seaside goldenrod. It's one of our taller, tallest goldenrods that are, um, commercially available. Goldenrod gets a bad rap because a lot of people associate it with allergies, um, but it's not the goldenrod that's doing it. Goldenrod pollen is pretty sticky. It doesn't, um, doesn't, it's not wind dispersed. So the idea that it's in the air causing allergies is not really plausible, but it blooms the same time and in the same habitat as ragweed. And ragweed doesn't have a flower that's as obvious as the goldenrod. So a lot of people mistake their ragweed allergy for an allergy to goldenrod. So if you think you're allergic to goldenrod and you haven't been formally tested or diagnosed with that, give it a try because it's an excellent plant um, for attracting pollinators. As you can see here, just on this close up of the flower, um, I think I can see four or five different insects. Um, it's great for attracting bees and butterflies and birds searching for insects. Birds love goldenrod because it's usually um, just a magnet for the insects that they want to eat. It blooms um, summer through fall. It might bloom as early as spring in South Florida. It's very easy to retain in the landscape. It does spread by underground rhizomes, so um, it can form dense colonies, but it's very easy to um, keep in check if you have a smaller landscape. But if you have the space and can plant it where it can, you know, really give you that show that it's known for, um, highly recommend it. It does need lots of sun to really put on those blooms. So um, it does tolerate shade, but you're not just, you're not gonna see quite the impact in a shady um, environment. I mentioned grasses earlier. Grasses are really important in the landscape. Um, this is Elliot's love grass. It is a larval host for the Zabulon skipper. Um, the seeds are tiny but prolific. There's so many of them and you can see them here in this photo. And invertebrates love them. Small birds also love them. And it's a bunch grass, so the foliage provides nice dense coverage as well for other wildlife. Um, it can tolerate a variety of conditions. It does great in nutrient poor soils. It's drought tolerant. Um, it can even handle a little bit of, of water inundation. So um, it's really can do well in pretty much any landscape. And it does have these spectacular um, wispy kind of blooms, but when it's not blooming, it's still a very attractive plant with it's a nice green um, bunch grass and it just looks quite nice in the landscape even when it's not in bloom. Uh, muley grass is another bunch grass that um, puts on an even more spectacular display. This is what it looks like in the fall when it's blooming. Um, it is just absolutely stunning to see these, you know, wispy, 
kind of fluffy purple um, blooms coming out in the fall. It's another one that's really versatile. Um, so it does great in a variety of conditions. It's drought tolerant, it's mildly salt tolerant, it's wind tolerant. Um, it self seeds, so it can maintain its population for a number of years. Um, and it's just, it, it's, a, it's just a good specimen plant, um, or you can also plant it in mass for you know, a really big, uh, big show. And the seeds are, are easy to propagate, so they, they germinate really easily. Um, this is redbud. This is one of our flowering trees. We are kind of on the southern end of it here. Uh, 9B is about as far as it likes, although you can tolerate just a little bit more of that heat, but it does like it to be a little bit cooler. Um, this one is deciduous, so it loses its leaves in the fall, and before it leaves out in the spring, it, it becomes covered in these magenta or pink blooms that you see on the screen. These, um, it's another bee, or excuse me, another pea family plant, and its flowers, like the um, partridge pea I mentioned earlier, are reliant on long-tongued bees to pollinate it, but they also attract um, caterpillars, especially io moth caterpillars, which are just really neat looking in themselves. I should have a photo because they're, they're really cool to see them on this plant. Um, deer browse the tree. The seeds are little pea pods and they're eaten by bob whites and other birds. Um, we can eat them too. The seeds and the flowers are edible to um, humans. So that's a bonus, right? Um, it's a fast growing tree. It can tolerate a little bit of flooding, um, but it's really just um, you know, such a great plant for adding that kind of pop of color in the spring. If you have a flowering dogwood, it's a nice complement to that too. Uh, cocoa plum is, um, gosh, it's kind of the, the, the best plant for providing all the resources that wildlife need. It has dense foliage, so, um, and it's evergreen, so it's providing cover year round. It fruits and flowers. Uh, simultaneously and throughout the year. Um, as you see in the photo on the left, the fruit is, it can be red or blue. It can even be white sometimes, depending on the variety of the plant you've, you've got and the conditions in which it's planted. Um, those fruits are really tasty to wildlife and to us. We can make uh, jam out of them or um, juice them or eat them raw. The seeds also um, oil rich and you can eat that as well. Um, but again, it's producing these resources all year long. It's a good plant um, if you need to put in like a hedge or a buffer uh, because it does uh, work well in mass, but it's also a good specimen or accent shrub too to add to your landscape. And it adapts to a variety of conditions. We're kind of on the Northern end of its range here. So it's definitely more of a South Florida subtropical plant, but it does great on the coast. Um, and uh, you, can, you can propagate it by seed. You can also do cuttings and air layering. So it's, it's just a really easy to grow, um, very tolerant plant that is great for um, a variety of conditions. This might be one of my favorites, although it's really hard to choose a favorite with so many amazing plants, but um, coral bean, you can see the hummingbird here. Hummingbirds love red tubular flowers. So anytime you have those in your landscape, like the um, hibiscus, the um, tropical sage I mentioned, you're gonna be attracting those hummingbirds too. It typically blooms in winter and spring. It is deciduous sometimes, although it can act as an evergreen. Um, again, some things vary depending on the, the conditions, but it's incredibly versatile. It's drought tolerant. It's good in coastal environments. Um, it's pest resistant. It does have little prickles on it, on its leaves and stems. So you do have to handle it carefully, but um, it's a good plant to include, especially if, you, if you're if you looking to um, discourage traffic or you, know, you can plant it under a window or something like that where you wanna maybe keep people away. Um, Yelp and holly, we have several species of holly native to Florida. This is the only one native to North America that is caffeinated. So you can make a tea out of its um, leaves. And um, you can actually purchase it commercially through Yalpin Brothers Tea. Um, look that up if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, the flowers are really tiny, these little white flowers that are attractive to small insects, particularly small bees. Um, it does flower and fruit simultaneously. So you get, uh, you know, again, a nice, interesting 
plant to look at because you've got white flowers, red berries, dark green, small leaves. Um, you can prune it and shape it into different, um, you know, if you like to do that sort of thing. It's another good one that you can put in mass if you want to create a hedge or a screen. Um, it doesn't require a lot of care. It's really tough. Um, the only thing that you would want to consider is that it, it can sucker, it can form a thicket if you let it take over, but all you have to do is remove those little seedlings if you don't want it to, um, you know, to take over the space that you've allocated to it. This uh, Simpson stopper is related to Suriname cherry, which um, you know I, I think a lot of people are familiar with because it's commonly used in landscapes. Um, unfortunately, Suriname cherry is an invasive species, so we don't want to encourage its use, but you can get the same qualities and same results from Simpson stopper. Um, here you see the white flowers that look like little fireworks. Um, the fruits you see there are immature. They'll actually turn a nice kind of tomato red or orangey red color when they're mature. We can eat them. Um, they have kind of a, like if you crossed a tomato with a cherry, it's kind of what they taste like. It's an interesting taste. Um, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's interesting. Um, and the leaves, when you crush them, have kind of a citrus or a piney scent. But again, it provides those resources, nectar from the flowers, um, fruits for birds, especially in the summer when it's really fruiting the most. This is a great ornamental plant because it has that dense foliage. It just, you know, has a, a lot of unique features that look good all throughout the year. It's also pretty cold tolerant. Um, and it does great in difficult areas too, where other plants um, may not do as well. And like I said, those fruits, you can take the seeds and propagate them pretty easily to grow uh, new specimens as well. Um, just a couple more plants to cover here before we wrap up. Um, trees are really important to a landscape. As I mentioned, they are um, harbingers of microhabitats, so they're providing um, not only resources, but also places for a lot of animals to live. Pines in particular um, are an important part of Florida's ecology. Slash pine that you see here is a really fast growing evergreen um, and it provides such vital food and habitat for small mammals, reptiles, um, other wildlife, uh, a lot of nesting birds or uh, birds that require nesting cavities will utilize um, pine trees. The flaky bark is also good habitat for insects, which of course provides protein and food for baby birds. Um, and even squirrels find uh, a, you know, food in the pine cones. They strip the seeds out of the cones. Um, the tree itself is edible to us too. It's kind of more of a famine food, but you can eat almost all parts of it, um, including the, the needles. You can make a tea out of the green needles. Um, you can eat the little pollen cones. The catkins are very high in protein um, and testosterone. Um, but that's not why you're planting in your landscape, right? You're not planting it just to, to grow food. You're planting it to provide resources for wildlife and to add a really nice accent to your landscape. Um, pine trees, if you have the space for them are, you know, they're just lovely and they drop their needles. So you have an ever, in a never ending supply of um, pine straw mulch, which is great to use on your landscape um, to help keep your weeds back, um, but also still allow uh, you know, your plants to reseed and, and be able to access the soil. So pine straw is a good, good um, mulch. And like I said, if you have the tree in your landscape, you don't ever have to buy it. Um, as important as pines are our oak species. This is uh, sand live oak. Sand live oak gives you all the benefits of a live oak, but um, if you have a smaller space, this is what you're looking for because live oaks, um, as we know, get super big and you know, send out those lovely long arching branches. The sand live oak um, is much smaller, so it doesn't require nearly as much space, but it, oaks are essential for wildlife. They are uh, the main source of insects for um, baby birds. So it's really, again, if you have the space for an oak or for a tree in your landscape, consider a sand live oak, um, or we have other smaller oaks. And again, if you, if you take the book or look at the book, we have a few other oak species mentioned. But of course, they provide food and shelter. They support so many insects. Um, it's just a highly valued plant for its ecological value. Um, and those acorns are also a food source for many man mammals and some birds. Um, if you live near scrub jay habitat, they thrive on sand live oak acorns. 
The plant's also a larval host for um, the oak hair streak and the red banded hair streak. So again, providing the resources for those caterpillars too. Oaks are evergreen. They do lose their leaves, but they don't drop them all at once. They lose them as they're, they push out the old leaves as they're um, growing new leaves. So the tree itself is evergreen, but it drops its leaves. Um, and again, here's another source of um, mulch. This is what I use in my landscape. I have um, a couple oak trees in my yard. And so I collect the leaves and spread it around my plantings and that um, acts as a mulch to help keep those um, weeds from, from taking over too much. Um, and finally, I end on uh, salt palmetto. This was a plant that took me a long time to come around to it. Um, when I started getting interested in Florida's native habitats and hiking, you know, this is the one thing that you see everywhere. Oh my gosh, more salt palmetto, more salt palmetto. But it is probably the most amazing plant in Florida. There are over 300 species of wildlife that have been documented that utilize this plant. Um, others that have an interlocking relationship with it, but it's very valuable to hundreds of birds, mammals, um, and insects as a source of food and cover. Um, it is a major source of nectar for honeybees. Um, the top three plants here in Florida for nectar for honeybees, and of course honey is a big agricultural crop for Florida. Um, the three top, top three plants are citrus, which if you know about our citrus industry, we're slowly losing that. Um, Spanish needles, which I talk about in my edible talk, but it's not a plant that we um, covered in the book, and saw palmetto. So very important um, to provide nectar for honeybees as well as other um, insects. And the berries are a staple for the Florida black bear. We can eat those uh, berries too. They're not particularly pleasant. Um, they taste kind of like uh, tobacco juice, if you can imagine what that tastes like. Um, but you can sweeten them and make a nice, um, you know, juice, uh, a nice drink out of it. Um, they bloom in the spring, but they're evergreen. They're slow growing. They're long lived. They are um, tolerant of a variety of conditions. Um, it's a nice one to plant as a specimen, or you can group it to form a low buffer. Um, these plants also have uh, sharp teeth along the leaf stem, so it's a good one to plant in an area where you want to discourage foot traffic. Um, but they're, they're very tolerant of conditions. They can tolerate sun and shade, um, varying levels of moisture, and it really just doesn't take much to establish them. But um, once they're in, they'll be with you for many, many, many years. So uh, again, these are just you know, a handful of the many species that we have here in Florida, native plants that can add real Florida style to your landscape and also provide vital resources for, um, for wildlife. Even the small, smallest garden, as I said earlier, can provide those resources. Um, it doesn't matter if you have just a patio at a condo or if you've got acres and acres of land, if you can, add native plants in if you can you know just do what you can every little bit helps um, provide something for wildlife that uh, is passing through trying to get to those other natural areas there are a lot of um, books out there for gardening and landscaping with native plants um, with our book we really try to take the guesswork out of going native and provide an easy to use guide for selecting planting and caring for them um, and uh, yes, you can get it on Amazon and I uh, should have asked Jen before I did this slide to make sure that you guys can get it in the bookstore, but it sounds like you'll be able to soon. Um, so, you know, thank you all for, for being here. If you want more information on um, planting, growing or maintaining our native plants, um, definitely check out our website, flawildflowers.org. Um, we have lots of resources. All of our resources you can download. We have handouts, brochures. We have lots of web pages, plant profiles, and more. Um, check us out on social media, Facebook, Instagram. Um, you know, stay abreast of what we're doing. Sign up for our e-newsletter. And, um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Stacy. We really appreciate it. We have a few questions. Um, I did just want to say real quickly, because 
I personally um, also work on the social media for the Florida Wildflower Foundation as my side gig. Um, definitely check out the Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, and you'll see a lot of great resources. Now, question, Stacy. So yeah. one of the first questions was, and I'll look and see who actually who actually wrote this, but someone was asking, how did you decide on these 100 plants out of all the different ecosystems and zones throughout Florida? Um, most of that came from Nancy in deciding. Um, I've been writing plant profiles for the foundation for many years. And so um, some of the plants I had already written about and, um, you know, kind of just, I made my suggestions. But Nancy being in the nursery industry knows what's being um, propagated. And she talked to nurseries all over the state to find out not only what are, you know, what do they have, what do they normally have, but what are they also trying to promote? Um, because a lot of plants like saw palmetto, for example, are not, you know, people don't normally think about those as landscape options, but nurseries are growing them more and more and making them more available. And so um, I really relied on her to, as the person in that industry, um, you know, to, to figure out what the best plants were and make sure that what we have in the book are plants that are, you know, suited for throughout the state. Most of the plants that we included are, are can be used anywhere in the state. Some of them are a little bit more specific, um, but, you know, we tried to find plants that are going to be easy for people to add to their landscape, because especially if you've never done this before, you don't want to start with a plant that requires so much time and effort, you're going to get frustrated, it's going to fail, you're going to not want to do this. But if everything, you know, if you pick the plants that are easy um, and you're successful, then you're encouraged to do more. So I think I kind of <laughs> danced around that a little bit, but um, but we really did try to find easy, tried and true plants that we knew growers were growing. So you can actually get these in places, in nurseries. Thanks, Stacey. So that, that question was from Ruth Ward. And we have another one that kind of dovetails onto that answer. Eric Garduno asks, are there any plans for a second edition of the book? Um, he's encountering really great native plants that aren't necessarily in the book, like fiddlewood, et cetera. I know you just put this one out a few months ago, so it might be a while. We would like to, I mean, I would love to do that. Um, and especially because, you know, even looking at the list that we started with and had to whittle it down, um, the 100 plant limitation came from the publisher, so we were bound by that, um, but there, you, he's right, there are so many more plants out there that make, you know, great landscape choices and that are readily available, so um, I, I don't have an answer, but I'm certainly open to that idea. Okay, thank you, Stacey. So another question, um, I answered partly, um, but maybe you can answer a little bit more in detail. So someone asked, about painted buntings that are visiting now nowadays down in South Florida, and are there any specific plants that are good for them? Now, my answer was to go on the Florida Wildflower Foundation's website, and you can find um, all kinds of information under attracting birds. Um, but do you happen to know about painted buntings specifically? I don't, and I'm sorry. I I I, <laughs> I know of painted buntings at the feeder, and. Um, so that doesn't really help uh, determine what plants attract it. But um, even even when I, I've never seen one in the wild, I've only seen them at feeders, even out at Merritt Island. Um, they come to the feeder at the visitor center, but I don't see them out in the wild. So I don't know what plants they, um, they prefer specifically. Well, the good news is if we're planting any of these native plants, generally we're gonna see more bird action because of the insects that they're attracting, et cetera. So definitely. Um, another question comes from Kevin Chung. Are there any wildflowers that do well in shade? And I know you talked about a few that, that definitely are. Yeah, there's quite a few. Um, you know, I mentioned um, wild petunia. Um, I didn't mention salvia micella, which is creeping sage. It's a low growing um, salvia that does really good in shade. Um, the twin flower does well. The difference is going to be, you know, there are a lot of plants that that will do well in shade, but they're not going to give you quite the um, the show. So the flowering will be a little less, um, and they may be a little bit leggier. I know, you know, um, what did I just say? Wild petunia. 
can get a little leggier in the shade. But even if you get some filtered light or if it's got you know a, a period of sun, that's gonna help bolster it a little bit. Um, but yeah, any of the ones I mentioned, well, that's not true. Most of the ones I mentioned do well. Um, Liar Leaf Sage is another good one for shade. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, even like cut leaf coneflower, I didn't mention that one today, but that's another one that um, can do well in shade. Stokes Aster, these are plants that, that you that do well in both. Um, I don't know, um, I don't have any that are specific, like just shade only, um, but I will say we are working on a, a new handout that will deal specifically with shade plants. So, um, you know, check out our website or, or look for it on social media. We should be getting that out in the next month or two, I think. And that's going to be dedicated just to shade plants and shade loving plants. That's great. That's really exciting. Thank you, Stacey. And we also have one coming out on aquatic plants too. So look for that one as well. Okay. Wow. That's great. Good for me to know. Um, <laughs> I have one, one quick question that um, hasn't been brought up yet in the chat, but I, I encounter it a lot. So I'm wondering if you might be able to answer. You talked a little bit about seeds and where to get them. Mm -hmm. I purchase native seeds rather than getting a generic mix at any big box store or other nursery. Great question. Um, well, a couple things. Usually at the at the chains, you know, at places where you can buy wildflower seeds, and I use air quotes around that, um, they're not selling native species. So, you know, that's one aspect of it. We we're trying to encourage native plants because native plants have evolved here. They have the, the requirements for wildlife. So we want to make sure we're getting natives. But beyond that, we want to also make sure that we know where those plants came from. So it, it's called an ecotype. Um, and not to get too deep into that, but it's you know, where was that plant grown and where were the seeds harvested? So if I'm getting milkweed, even though milkweed, um, butterfly milkweed, for example, is native to Florida, it's also native to many other states in the country. So you can buy milkweed seeds on the internet that maybe came, that were, that were harvested from plants in Colorado. Now, Colorado has completely different conditions than Florida. So in Colorado, those plants are act acclimated to high altitude, cold temperatures, different soil components. So you're bringing that species here. And even though, again, it's the same species, it's, it, it's parents, you know, were, were in, growing in different conditions. So it's not gonna perform the same in our climate, at our elevation, you know, all the things that are specific to Florida that make it so different from Colorado, for example, are gonna be a factor in whether or not that seed survives. So you wanna make sure that you're getting native species that are from native ecotypes or native stocks. And you can ensure that not only just with seeds, but also with plants by purchasing them from you know, nurseries and, and farmers who specialize in those plants, um, rather than you know, buying them from the, the big box garden centers who are trucking in plants from all over the country, or um, you know, again, buying seeds online where you don't know where they're, they're originating from. Thank you, Stacy. That's great. And just to reiterate again, if you want Florida wildflower seeds, fall is really the, the best time for a lot of these that need um, a season of cold to spur their growth in the spring. So you can go to floridawildflowers.org um, to get some dot of those. Com, dot, com. dot com. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I know a lot of people are starting to head out, but we just want to thank you again so much for being here today on our webinar. Stay tuned um, to our websites and social media to find out more about how to see this recording later and see future programs um, in the future. <laughs> Thanks Great. again. Say if um, if you didn't get your question answered, you're welcome to email it to info at flawildflowers.org and um, we will do our best to respond to you quickly. Sounds great. Thanks again, Stacey. Thanks to everybody. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. For, and thanks Sunken Gardens for having me. And um, yeah, thanks for all of you who watched and participated. All right. Happy planting, everyone. <laughs>